Let's take a look at band theory and see how it helps us explain how things conduct electricity. Materials can be grouped into two groups called conductors and insulators. Semiconductors are a subgroup of insulators. Now, for conductors, we have the following. Applying a potential difference to these materials will make a current flow through them. And all metals are conductors. For example, carbon, even though it's a non-metal, is a conductor too. But the main thing is by applying a potential difference to these materials, an electric current can flow through them. For insulators, well, applying a potential difference to these materials will not let electricity flow through them. In fact, very large potential differences or voltages across these materials is needed to make current flow through them. Woods, plastic and gases are insulators, but with sufficiently high voltage they can conduct, as witnessed by lightning, when the air, which is usually an insulator, breaks down because of the high voltages across it. And we've got a group also, which is a subgroup of insulators, and they're called semiconductors. And these are materials which conduct with small voltages, and when heat is applied, they become better conductors, but still very poor at conducting. Silicon is an example of a semiconductor. Now, how to understand conductors, insulators and semiconductors? Well, materials such as metals are excellent conductors because, quite basically, they have lots of free electrons which are able to move through the metal. The, met the electrons can move into spaces uh, round what we call shells. When electrons cannot move freely, the material becomes a poor conductor because the electrons cannot move about. So we must look to the atom to see why some materials have free electrons and others don't. That's a picture of copper, and you can see copper is made up of 29 electrons, but they're all arranged in a certain way, which restricts some, and others are free. Let's see why. Well, here we have the copper atom again, and they're surrounded by shells. The electrons live in these shells. Now, there's a rule for these shells, and there's a rule for how much electrons can fit in that shell. So in the first shell, which is this one here, the very inward one, the first shell, the rule is 2n squared, where n is the number of the shell. So we can see from the table when n is 1, the first shell, you're going to have 1 times 1 and multiply it by 2. You're going to have two spaces for electrons, and that's filled up right away by two electrons in here. No more electrons can go in that shell. For the second shell, we can have 2 twos are 4, and times 2 gives us 8, according to the formula. So therefore, there's 8 spaces for the electrons to take up. And indeed, those 8 spaces are taken up. And the same with the third shell as well. We can use the formula. 3 squared is 9. 2 nines are 18. So there's spaces for 18 electrons in the third shell. And they're filled up as well. But look at the fourth shell. The rule is 4 4 is 16 and 2 16s 32. So there's 32 possible spaces for the electron to be in, in that outer shell. And there's only one. So that means there's 31 extra spaces. So you can see that electrons get plenty of space to move about. And therefore, copper is a fantastic conductor. Now, rather than draw the shells in a circular form, we can transform them into this form here, where we show the energy level diagrams. The shelf method, if you want to think of it that way, each of these lines here represents an energy level. And the higher you go up, the bigger the energy. Now, we've taken all the electrons from each of those energy level shells and put them in. Two in the first shell, full up. And you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight in the second shell, all full up. This shell's all full up, and look at the top shell shell up here, the highest energy level. It has only got one electron in it, and it's got plenty of free space. Remember, it can hold 32 electrons in that energy level, and it's only got one little electron in it now, so it's plenty of space for the electrons to move. And therefore, copper is a good conductor. In fact, a very good conductor. Plenty of space. Now, materials don't just contain one atom and one set of energy levels. Materials contain more and billions of more than one atom. There's one atom, and you can see its energy levels. 
if we have two atoms as a strange effect takes place due to quantum theory. More about that when you go to university. But you've got two atoms, the energy levels seem to bunch like that. It's a bit like going into B and Q and seeing the ladder uh, rack. You have one ladder for sale, two ladders for sale, and you can see that it's very hard to distinguish the individual rungs. Now, if we go to three atoms, the energy levels seem to stack like that. And this quantum effect has the effect of having, when we have many atoms together, the individual energy levels seem to be smeared into one. So they don't have energy levels anymore, but they've got energy bands. The energy bands contain a multitude of energy levels, all stacked up and all smeared out. So that's an energy band. That's an energy band, and so is that. And in between, you have the energy gap. Now, the electrons are forbidden to be in that energy gap. So you can see if we start with one atom, the energy levels, will we move up to billions of atoms, as they are in a metal, the energy levels smear into what we call energy bands. Now here's an energy, here's a, a particular atom here, and you can see that it's got four bands, and three of them are chock a full, which means there can be no movement of electrons in these bands here. We say one, two, and three energy bands are full, so the electrons are not free to move up to the next energy level. Now, usually these bands are ignored in the diagram because the electrons have nowhere to go. We're much more interested in this band up here. And you can see that this band is not completely full. It's got some electrons in it and most of it is empty. So therefore, the electrons in here are free to move about this empty band. Remember what a band is? It is a multitude of energy levels. So the electrons can free to move about all about that particular uh, band. And that's a quick summary of that there. Energy level 4 has many energy levels free, and so only partially filled uh, is the band. So with a minimum of energy, electrons here can move about to the many different levels within the band. And here we have a metal here, and you can see this top band here is what we call uh, only partially filled up. The valence band consists of this one here, and it's you almost can see that it's crept into the band up here as well. Now the valence band is defined as a band where the outer electrons occupy. So you can see that valence band stretches up into here. The band where the electrons are free to move is called the conduction band. So the conduction band is where the electrons can move about. So you can see the structure for a metal. It has a valence band which really is encroaching into the conduction band and that makes it so good a conductor because these electrons here can move about this band quite freely. In this example said there the valence band and the conduction band practically overlap and that's a picture of what a metal looks like if we look at it in band theory. Now, there's one other interesting thing you have got to talk about, that's what we call the Fermi level. Now, what is the Fermi level? Well, it's the highest energy level in a conduction band that has electrons. And another way of thinking about it is it's where you'd expect to find the topmost electrons. It's a bit like filling a glass of water. The line of the water is where you expect the water to end, if you can think of it that way. So the Fermi level really is the highest energy level in the conduction band. And that's represented by that like a dotted line along here like that. So here we have the band structure for a metal and an insulator. And you can see the big difference. For the metal, the valence band has crept into the conduction band. And the Fermi level is along here. And therefore, electrons can move about the conduction band quite freely. Therefore, the metal is a good conductor. But if you take a look at the insulator, you can see that the valence band stops here, and it's filled up. There's nowhere for the electrons to go. And there's an energy gap above it, which gives you into the conduction band. That's the land of the free. But these electrons here cannot reach it because there's an energy gap. So that's the difference between a metal and an insulator in terms of band theory. The valence band for an insulator is completely filled up and the energy gap prevents any electrons from moving up into the conduction band. 
you can see the Fermi level for the insulator is way down here, compared to the metal where the Fermi level is inside the conduction band. Now, what's the difference between an insulator and a semiconductor? Remember, the insulator, the valence band, was separated from the conduction band by a big energy gap. Well, if we look at the semiconductor, you can see that, that energy gap is not too big. And we can see that the valence band, even though it's filled up, the Fermi level, the place where you find the outmost electrons, should be about here. But with a little bit of heat, might be enough energy to make the electrons jump that energy gap into the conduction band. And that's what makes the semiconductor a better conductor if we heat it up. The big difference is, is that the energy gap between an insulator and a semiconductor is much different. The semiconductor energy gap is much smaller than the insulator. So there you have the picture of the band theory for three of our groups. The metal, the insulator and the semiconductor. Now a metal is a fantastic conductor. Why? Take a look at the picture. The valence band is inside the conduction band practically and therefore the electrons have got plenty of free space above to move about. So therefore the metal will be a good conductor. When we look at the insulator, we can see that there's a big band gap, a big energy gap between the valence band, the places where the electrons are filled up to, and the conduction band. And these electrons can't get into that conduction band. But remember, if we provide a bigger potential difference across that material, you could provide some of the electrons with enough energy to break into the conduction band. Think of air breaking down with lightning. But in most cases, insulators do not conduct. But look at the semiconductor. The semiconductor has got a valence band filled up. There's the Fermi level. But the big difference is the energy gap between the valence band and the conduction band is small enough for heat in order for heat to provide the energy to put the electrons into the conduction band. So you can make a semiconductor a slightly better conductor. Now, a good way to look at this is if you go to football grounds. And if you go to football grounds, physics is all round about you. And you can see that a football stadium where we have all the seats down here filled up, we can imagine that to be the one of the uh, bands in the actual uh, band theory we were looking at. And you can see some of the seats here are filled up in the next level. But you can see you get plenty of free seats here. So all the seats occupied by the fans down here cannot move. That corresponds to this band here. The next higher tier has got some spectators in it, but still a lot of free space. So they're free to move. So that type of stadium could be used to model a metal or a good conductor. This area all fill up. The top tier partially filled up, but spaces for you to move about and pick your seat to move about and therefore that means that that type of stadium could be used for a model for a metal. What about a insulator? Now you're talking this stadium. You can see the bottom tier here is completely filled up with spectators but spectators can't get to the next tier because of this big large wall here. You can't climb the wall into the next area and that represents the band theory for an insulator. The valence band is completely filled up, bottom tier filled up, and there's a gap, that's that gap there, to the conduction band, to the places where there's many a free seat, but these spectators can't get there. So that stadium could be a model for an insulator. What about a semiconductor? Well, here's a semiconductor here, and you can see the semiconductor that we have got the full bottom tier here all filled up, and there's just a small gap with stairs to get into the area where there's lots of free seats. That area there representing lots of free seats represents the conduction band. And the small gap here where you can climb the stairs is represented as the energy gap. And the bottom one here is the bottom tier of valence band which is completely filled up. So that stadium there could be a good stadium for a semiconductor model.